Now? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 Great. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Right, I'll keep it brief. Um, <coughs> this is the second day of the, Glass the first ever Glastonbury William Blake Festival. And I will say, it does feel like the band himself has been with us all the way through. Uh, yesterday, this week, the forecast was thunderstorms and so forth. And yesterday, Paul opened the festival in the Abbey with a beautiful speech. Um, and the sun was out, boiling hot and absolutely gorgeous. <coughs> and then we did, uh, we did two hours of poetry and some music uh, by the Market Cross, which I can see lots of faces who joined in with that or were spectating, and that was really divine. And the rain held off the whole time, and then we had a sudden downpour, brilliant, with perfect timing, just as we finished, and I was thanking everybody, the heavens opened. So, uh, Oh, it's, it's, it's been magical. So thank you all for being here tonight. I'm going to hand over to Paul. With William Blake and the Glastonbury Gnosis, please give a very warm festival welcome to Paul Weston. Uh, 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 in London, and I thought we'd have them on the heart back, Glastonbury. 
On the very first page of that book, she says, the poetry of soul writes itself at Glastonbury. And I've adopted that term, soul poetry, to get a kind of sense of what it is about those stories, this mythology that moves us. And we'll say that Blake was very, very uh, influenced by some very strange antiquarian ideas about British history and so on. We can't be stupid to historically deconstruct them and say, well, that just isn't true, therefore the poetry doesn't work. Of course it's not like that. So what I'm saying tonight, where well, I'm going with this, and the idea of blasphemy gnosis, it's certainly not a standard history lesson, but there's a lot of history involved. So, Blake's studies were revolutionised quite recently, actually. Uh, I think it was in 2002, uh, Marshall Shinshaw published, uh, the English version was my, why Mrs. Blake cried. Uh, I, I can understand why the Americans wanted to kind of slightly sex it up a bit. It probably is about time from the point of view of selling a few copies. This was a uh, revolutionary scholarship in as much as it established the membership of Blake's mother with a particularly strange <coughs> congregation, who I'll be talking about um, a little bit later, and went into the whole subject of the occult mystical underground in London in the 18th century which is one of the most fascinating topics that you could possibly want to get into. You know, we have this kind of, um, there's such a big deal in the 19th century, the roots of modern uh, occultism and mysticism, with the beginnings of spiritualism, the Vatican's theosophy, the golden dawn. People might be done to appreciate that there was an absolutely extraordinary scenario going on in London, right across Europe. The, as some really kind of um, modern nuances about it, uh, as, as we discovered. And, you know, I was fortunate to introduce this, this book quite early after it was first published, and it blew my mind, you know, and I knew I would come back to it. But one of the, one of the strange turning points was when I read um, in 2013 this book, Lipstick Traces. Now, this is quite a contentious. Um, uh, almost notorious case. Ron Harkins was a, a rock journalist, American rock journalist. He wrote about stuff like Elvis Presley and Bob Dylan. But he'd been present at the last Sex Pistols concert in San Francisco in January 1978, which I have atrociously put as 1977 in my book, but that's what happens when you write the introduction 15 minutes before you got finishing. He was very taken by the strange quality of the mood and the energy that was present. He found it very, very unsettling. And he felt that Johnny Rock, John Lydon, was a kind of unconscious mouthpiece, you know, even in an almost shamanic way, for some kind of deeper undercurrent of extreme strangeness that somehow echoed back through the ages. And he wanted to kind of investigate what it was about those feelings. Well, where, how far can we go with it? He ends up writing this 500 page book and he traces this <coughs> kind of cultural, subcultural lineage that goes back through uh, the situationists. You know, some of you know that Malcolm McLaren was quite influenced to some extent by their ideas. Goes back further to the Dardaeists, the Surrealists, and then it goes way back. And he goes into what he can only call tangential, tangential realms because he goes back to medieval heresies, the brethren and the free spirit, and so on. There's a guy called John <coughs> Lydon, and because that sounds a bit like John Lydon, you know, that's enough for him to kind of weave his associations together. And he's kind of conscious that he's doing that. You know, he, he, he puts into the narrative the fact that he is. Uh, create the myth himself as he's investigating. Now, over the years, you know, my, my paperback edition of this had a quote from John um, <laughs> saying, you know, this, this is pretty good, but uh, on numerous other occasions, he's mouthed off some critic about what a pot of shit he doesn't agree with at all. I think a lot of this is to do with his, his nation of clarity. But somewhere in the back of my head, I thought, I'd kind of like to write a book a little bit like that. 
And as I got into this process, uh, to my great amazement, um, I encountered sex pistols again but in a different kind of context to the one that Marcus had really established. And we also got to say a big, big yay to our own, our very own Mr. Jeffrey Ash. You know, back in uh, 1967, he'd been involved as kind of secretary for the archaeological dig at Cabin Castle. And he'd kind of been stirred to follow on why people are uh, so strangely moved by the, the stories of Arthur. And he ended up with a consideration that was full of Blake. You know, the, the, there's a particular quote by Blake about the deeds of Arthur being uh, really the deeds of Albion applied to a, a, a prince of the 5th century. Uh, it, it, there's a whole uh, investigation of all ideas of chivalry and Camelot, he takes us for Gandhi and Rousseau and all over the place. There's a lot of Blake in there. It's a great book, and anybody that lives in Glasgow, anybody that's interested in these subjects who hasn't come across it, I can't recommend it highly enough. This is probably the prime stimulus uh, that sets me off in this way. But I'm also a history nerd. Yeah, I am a history nerd, but I am really big on putting stuff, you know, I contextualise things. And David Erdman is, is the prime white scholar who has set like absolutely firmly in the context of the historical times that he lived in. You know, a number of these poems which say, you know, very easy you know, have some crack and very much part of somebody's very distinct personal vision, which they obviously are, are none of these responses to a whole lot of stuff that's going on at the time. You know, the, uh, the revolutionary upheavals in France, the Napoleonic Wars, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and this is in quite considerable detail. So if you're not familiar with Erdman and you're interested in, in, in Blake, this is a great place to start with. But for me, really, I guess, you've got to say, it all starts here. Because I was, you know, a tremendous fan. I still am a tremendous fan of Jim Morrison from Doors. And the great thing about Jim is that he left so many breadcrumbs behind him because the songs are just full of all these references to books, you know, to various thinkers. And I had this kind of thing whereby, if I knew Jim Morrison had written, written and read a book, I would find it and I would read it. And that involved me, uh, for example, um, reading Nietzsche's book of tragedy or going through a 900 page abridgment of the Golden Bower just because I knew there were a couple of chapters in it, featured in some doors and doors, this kind of thing. <laughs> and you know, this process, I often think, and it's a good one to apply to Blake, uh, the measure of the capacity of how, how great an artist is, or a great thinker it is, or how great a spiritual force, if you like, is being carried by them, is just how much, what strange company you can find yourself in if you investigate them. You know, uh, Jim Morrison led me to all of this literature, all of these books, all of these ideas. Suddenly, for example, I like had to cry me as a result of, of getting interested in him, or find myself. You know, watching the films of Ken Fanger, or getting interested in rocket science Jack Parsons, uh, or, or even reading Robert Anton Wilson's books. That's a very expansive honesty. You know, what we're going to hear about tonight, some of the people that we're going to encounter, is an example of how far Blake uh, can take us. So, as a result of, of being in some doors, obviously, as probably you all know, their name came from this, this quote. Uh, of blokes about the doors of perception that has kind of been filtered by Aldous Huxley and his famous book on his mescaline experiences. Now sometimes when I tell people you know, how, how many times I've read certain books they, they look at me as if I'm completely crazy. But I, I, I say to how many times have you listened to your favourite album? You know, some album that you first bought 20, 30, 40 years ago, how many times have you listened to it? You don't think it's a problem that you've done that like. When I was about 18, the Doors of Perception is not a long book, I don't know how many times I read it. Dozens of times, dozens of times. And I was also led to reading Mona Wilson's Life of William Blake. I think um, a definite acceleration in, in my, my Blake enthusiasm came in, in 1985, when uh, I 
this during a course in the study of art at the university, and I went to coach it because there's a special exhibition of the type gallery of the pre Raphaelites. And I know that there was all stuff, some really blank stuff in there, so I did the experiment of microdosing on LSD. Uh, and I got it just right, you know, quite often these experiments, they can go a little bit wrong, but on this, <laughs> this occasion, it went right because I saw the pre Raphaelite paintings and they were in supreme high definition, you know, the, the, the figures in them were literally breathing in and out, they were not quite <laughs> moving. You know, you, you didn't have a whole load of hallucinations intruding, it was absolutely awesome. But then you go into the plate room, and then you're going to another level of the game altogether. Because this stuff is like a representation of some deep, deep, higher level of the collective consciousness on some mythic level. And because of it being what it is, it is alive. And there was a sense of kind of recognition that somehow I was seeing something that was somewhere also the case, somewhere deep in my consciousness. And I just, the divinity of it was something that, that had, you know, as many of you know, the emotional uh, aspect of the psychedelic experience is, is quite often as powerful as the visual. This thing hit me really, really strongly. So let's go into the four myth influences of the Blake. I'm not going to go, you know, I can, Shiv Shard's done a whole book on this. It's an immense topic, but this is um, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Simsendorf. You know, he looks a normal enough 18th century kind of guy. Um, you know, he's a European aristocrat, very well connected, Masons, capitalists, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, it, it gets involved with this set uh, that come to be called the Moravian Church, uh, who have been hanging about for hundreds of years on the outskirts. They're, they're kind of heretics. They've been almost living underground. They seek refuge in the state, and he takes them all. And <coughs> in this country, you know, he moves to very wide <coughs> circles. Uh, he's there on the far right, and he's with the king. George III, and he gets a whole scenario whereby the Moravians are kind of accepted um, as not in, in quite, not in the same way as the Church of England, but they're not descendants, they're, not, they're, they're allowed to be who they are. And that's fair, that seems fair enough, but where they, where they get to is pretty extraordinary. Now, this is one of my favourite history books, Norman Cunningham's The Pursuit of the Millennium, and it tells us all about barking mad um, millennial visionaries of the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, and their, their quests where they go off and found these utopian communities where maybe everybody's naked or it's all freed up and they've abolished money, and everything seems pretty groovy for a little while before they all get massacred. You know? And it's, it's always been tremendous stuff for me, and I just had this kind of recognition as I started reading about the Moravians, because somewhere on the line, um, a little while about halfway through the, through the 18th century, the Holy Spirit comes down on them. You know, it's Sims and Dorf, there they all are, the Holy Spirit's coming down. What on earth is all that about? You know, Mark, no one comes to Marxist story, there's an awful lot of stuff uh, that you can say is, is bad, it's commentary on the state of societies uh, in the Middle Ages and the Middle Ages and why they give birth to certain kinds of situations. But as somebody who's, you know, I'm about in the guru scene and accept the old shat's power and a bit of the old Kundalini going on, I'm also aware of the fact that there is something also pretty damn mysterious that kicks in in these situations. Uh, you know, the, the two explanations are not necessarily exclusive. It can all happen at the same time. And when you hear how these guys start to carry on, uh, you start to appreciate that, that something unusual is happening. Because these, these guys were very, very progressive in terms of their attitudes towards sexuality. Uh, they would, for example, as part of their church community uh, situations, have uh, group confessionals where everybody talked about what kind of sex they had like before. And it's considered to be, you know, almost a form of prayer that it's good for God if everybody has been set. So it's fair enough to us after the 1960s. But because we've got in our 
historic consciousness, this kind of enormous kind of thing of the Victorian era hanging between us and them. You know, if you're not really familiar with this, it can be a bit of a shock to realise where these people were at. And since Dolph was completely and utterly um, infused with Kabbalah, again, you know, we sometimes think to ourselves, the occult mystery schools of the, the, you know, the Gold Dawn, Crowley Dion Fortune, Kabbalah, okay. But there's actually, at that period of time, an immense amount of really big stuff that is being transmitted throughout Europe on this subject. And since Dolph is going to be somebody who's familiar with the idea, uh, for example, that you can potentially have sex with angels, uh, that all kinds of mystical attainments are possible in various sexual styles. And quite often some of these community gatherings, uh, they get into a state of rapture. You know, and it's kind of borderline what the psychoanalyst might have called sexual hysteria. But in one respect, it gets very, very strange indeed. I'll thank you to Martha Shishaw for drawing my attention to this extremely strange book and this extremely strange topic. Because Zinzendorf was obsessed with the wounds of Christ. And obsessed in a way that to us seems downright icky. And there's a kind of tradition in, in, in medieval Christian art. When we think of the wounds of Christ, we think of the crucifixion. But actually, strictly speaking, the first wound of Christ is his circumcision. And there's an enormous obsession about all of this. And this book here, which is written by, you know, Tom academic in America, it's not some crank work. Uh, it really cracks me up, you know, the first chapter in is whether the subject exists. The second is whether the subject will be publicised. And by the time you got to chapter four, we've dived in at the deep end of the practice of fondling a man child's genitalia. And don't worry, I'm not going to show you any of this shit. I know that well, but definitely don't need to see this. I certainly know that the YouTube congregation definitely don't need to see it as well. But if you go on Amazon and you find this book, uh, there is a look inside, certainly. You can scroll down and you will see some stuff that you cannot understand, believe me. <laughs> and they actually, you know, the congregation. Uh, in, in the Moravian church ended up singing songs in praise of Christ's famous. You know, you don't expect that from you go to church on a Sunday. And there are also a complex visualisation exercises concerning the worms. And literally, you know, like in, in the worm in Christ's mouth, there's a whole enormous great area in there where you can kind of go in and sort of there's a bed in there or there's a living room or whatever. And people go into ecstatic states. And, and it's in certain circumstances, there are a group of young men, since it's sort of sun, you know, it's a noble one, they've got this castle in Europe. There's some very strange stuff that they're all getting into rapturous states. But what's intriguing is, is you know, Blake's mother, Blake's mother was part of this congregation when all this stuff was going on in London. She was, um, you know, undoubtedly present when all kinds of very, very cute ideas were being put forward. And yet, Blake himself, and this is a measure of the man's temperament, I think, is not necessarily, we can't seem to be influenced by the, the craziness of this, but we can say there are some influences of the good side, the attitude towards sexuality, the, an attitude towards the health of bringing up the children that Catholic Blake has got for next people. So that's all part of a very mysterious backdrop that is very, very formative and gives us a sense of just how weird the art of the was. And the example I've, I've, I've got here, you know, is that we have more perspectives on art and what it means and how we respond to it. And we, we can't get into the mindset of people who originally created the art. We all, well, we all, in Glastic, we all people think that this tone uh, of, of this mind key is, is this picture of space you get. I've seen a pretty good type down on it by our specialists who show there is an at all. And it's like when you say this stuff, uh, this weird art, I kind of try to get my head around it and think to myself, well, it's just our culture. But I can't get rid of it. Maybe I'm just being judgmental, maybe. 
does say like a flame of her like all the shit today, and I still know the other from it. <laughs> Dennis is the man explaining the world. What a guy he was. He's one of the cleverest dads that ever lived if we kind of take the rest of psychology. Just gonna have a stop to chat over the year. Man explaining the world. Clever dogs, you know, there's a bunch of psychologists in the early part of this century in America, they were sort of working out to their own satisfaction anyway uh, what the IQs of various famous historical figures were. They were actually Sweden Broad was like one of the very few people over 200. He was a scientist, he's a logical man, you know, he's a kind of almost a Leonardo, I think he did some uh, diagrams and better than a fly machine. He usually saw sort of malarkey, but when he gets into his early 50s, Enormous visionary stuff just starts happening on an absolutely epic scope. Uh, he is infused with Kabbalah, so there's a whole bunch of stuff about angels, sex with angels, and so on and so forth. It's very interesting that he talks of being taken to India and leaving teachers there. Uh, you know, there's a certain awareness of some of the designs on Indian temples at that point. Some of this is in the airwaves there, and he goes to other planets. Encounters various you know, entities in different realms and creates a new Jerusalem church. It's very complicated stuff because there's a Masonic scene going on. All of this stuff is a lifetime study in itself, but the fact is the man is a powerful, powerful visionary and he's in London and he's, he's hanging out with the Moravians at the same time that they're all going batshit crazy in there. And for a while he kind of says, Well, okay, and he says, no, I'm not having this, and he goes off on his own. But Blake and his wife, very, very influenced by all of this. They, they're on the kind of edge of the sweet book scene, and they, they back off a little bit. But this idea, you know, the simple fact that Blake has an example of somebody who is catapulted in the visionary realms, and is able to, you know, create his own system out of all of these incredible influences that are there at the time, uh, I think it's quite, it's quite significant. I mean, Blake is somebody, as far as we know, who's who's born into it. But Swedenborg's a very, very powerful uh, influence on him at the time. Blake's talent for eyes is, is clear quite early on. He's an apprentice to a guy called Richard Cosway from the age of 10. And, and again, it's, it's important to understand that the circles in society, the level of the circles that he's moving in, are, are quite in the higher echelons. Uh, you know, Cosway is somebody that's pre uh, painted um, Prince of Wales, he's got a lot of um, customers who get to do um, miniatures, and he's, he's also he's, um, paints various people, aristocrats at the time, uh, usually kind of classical parties, and shows the extent to which that sort of mythology is around at the time as part of the general language of the culture. And this is, uh, this is kind of put around the, uh, the famous girl and that. And Cosway's married to uh, a woman called Mar Maria, and it's said to be a marriage of millions. You know, it, it, like so many other of these aristocratic types, it's just a libertine. Um, it pretty much encourages his wife to have affairs with other people. And this includes um, family father Thomas Jefferson. There's a whole scene that she's having with him in Paris. There was even uh, a very dumb movie made about that about mm -hmm. 20 years ago with Nick Nolte and Greg Sarkey. Uh, it shows, again, you know, they, these are the kind of people that are there as Blake is coming to maturity. Their, their social scene is something that he's going to be aware of. Maria's a, a painter as well, you know, she does some, some quite interesting stuff. This is a Persian woman um, worshipping the sun of sunrise. But Rich Cosway, um, he knows Casanova. Uh, he actually does a, a miniature erotic painting of Casanova. He had quite a, a side of business on this. Now, I can only say, uh, if you are used to maybe David Tennant's Casanova or Hank Ledger's Casanova, or even if you're a bit older and you remember Frank Finley on the BBC's Casanova, for Evan Sutton, Donald Sutton, and for Lady's Castanova. In terms of the ambience, in terms of the mode of the 18th century, in terms of the visual splendor, 
in terms of absolutely everything about it. This thing is absolutely supreme, I recommend it to you, uh, unreservedly. So you've got this really exotic, you know, absolutely filled up with all of these esoteric nuances, culture that Blake is born into and that comes to maturity in, and the kind of literature, the kind of ideas that are fading in these people are also fading in. You know, there's, there's no doubt about that at all. And one of the most interesting cases is the, the legendary Kanky Ostro uh, and his wife Serafina. You know, they're in London at the time. They created uh, this <coughs> subtle Egyptian Freemasonry. Now, people who don't know anything about it think that if they investigate it, it's going to be all about Egyptian deities and stuff. It's not really, it's kind of a messy stuff. But they're all on the same. All of these people are the same at the same time. And in fact, uh, Martha Shishel has suggested, uh, I couldn't find an image of it, I wish I could, that there is a particular piece of early play card work um, that it involves <coughs> seems to be some young children uh, looking into some, some bowls of water or such like that is a definite feature of one of Cagliostro ceremonies. And it's not totally impossible that Blake might have actually met Cagliostro, which is an extraordinary film. And just, you know, because I wanted to show this image, I think it's very moving. This is, is the cell where Cagliostro was in prison by the Inquisition, spent his last years, and people still come and leave flowers there. But there's one guy, uh, above all others, who is very, very mysterious on, on the scene there. This is Samuel Falk, and he's known throughout Europe for being you know, capitalistic Jewish mystical superstar and political intriguer. He's lucky to get away without being burned at the stake for some black magic um, accusation in Central Europe. He comes to London and there's a whole mythology about all of his magical powers and all the rest of it. There seems to be a case to be made that if there's a kind of secret chief or whatever, if you like to use those occultist terms, that is influencing all these people, it's this guy. There are suggestions he actually told Swedenborg. There are suggestions that he actually told um, Cagliostro even. And what's really intriguing, and we are at WB8, this, this insight, is during the late part of Blake's life, where he's very much stuck on his own work and his own system, during the time uh, that he's living in a place called South Malton Street in London, and he's writing, you know, since the time that he writes the long prophetic books Melbourne in Jerusalem, Richard Cosway has actually got a house, especially, that's virtually just over the road. And this house is set up for the sole purpose of working magic. You know, there's, there's a certain permanent drawer on the floor in there. And there's a group working all kinds of weird characteristic and stuff in there. And, you know, Yates traces him back. Uh, to Falk, although Falk is dead by this point, but things have been set in motion by him. So these guys are literally just over the, over the road from Blake at this time, and this all just posed again there's a certain section of mysticism in it. Lord George Gilgan, considered by many to be congenitally barred or mad. You know, his whole family supposedly would be on the eccentric side. Gilman is kind of like where all of this kind of same <coughs> bubbles, well, it runs to the surface in the most peculiar way. And in dealing with him, I, I, I also bring to your attention what to me is one of the most outstanding features of the London Mystical Underground. Is that, uh, a doctor, James Graham, who, who founded a cult that pacifist sexology and he got enough money to create um, a kind of temple of the we call it a tanky temple now uh, and in this place he's got an enormous bed okay all around is, is decorated with what I call a statuary there is a dome half a dome in the, in the ceiling that uh, can be um, manipulated to release perfumes into the room. There are these kind of pipes and tubes that will play music into the room. And the bed 
uh, is able to be made to vibrate and a mild electric current is put, can be put through it and there are levers on it that can adjust the position of it so that if there's a couple in this bed engaged in sexual activity they can turn you know, the full thing on and, and have an absolutely overwhelming experience and this is the idea of it it's, it's conceived of in an absolutely overtly mystical manner you know, you literally please God you have the most extraordinary sexual experience possible in a mystical way. And, you know, Glastonbury being very honest, you're 200 years behind the game here. You know, somebody who, who set something up like that back here would surely be on a winner. <laughs> and money was charged, you know, you could spend, you could take something in there and spend the night. And, and Lord George Golden was one of the people who uh, partook of this, he, you could call him an addict to the celestial bed. <coughs> Golden is just incredibly important as we're now going to say. Yeah, I'm going to, if I seem to be going off at a tangent, William Blake becomes very, very central to this story of, of George Golden. At that time, the American War of Independence is still going on. We're now talking 1780, okay? And Catholics in this country had no rights, you know, they weren't allowed to vote or anything like that. And there was a kind of scheme whereby it was considered that maybe if you cut a little bit of slack, then you can let them fight as mercenaries uh, if they pledge allegiance to the king in the North American War. And you know, people forget just what big deal that war, that whole thing was, because it's not just up at the British fighting George Washington. France is also declared war with Britain. France is helping the Americans. There's also other countries involved that are fighting in Europe. There was a, a, a second Spanish Armada scene. You know, there was literally an Armada going down the English Channel, all set to invade, sailing back and forth for months. There are people like John Paul Jones from the American contingent there. All of this is in the air. It's absolutely crazy, it's, it's wild. And when the suggestion is put forward, Golden, who on the whole is somebody that is quite cool about radical causes, you know, he supports, um, he's very critical of the treatment of slaves in the West Indies, for example, but he gets really agitated about the idea of, of any kind of Catholic rights, and non popery And he rattle rouses to a certain extent and an enormous great petition uh, supposedly over 100,000 signatures is delivered to Parliament in June 1718. And I won't have it. And somehow or another, something just erupts from the depths uh, that you can't really say has got anything to do with just the whole Catholic issue. The Golden Rites erupt. And the Golden Rites, it's interesting to me because I've, I've known a few people that have lived in London who have not even kind of really heard of this, which uh, if I was going to list what are the most important things that have ever happened in London, you'd kind of say the Blitz and the Fire in London and Burdica and then I'd say the Golden Rides. This thing went on for a week and everybody got involved in it. You know, it's, it's very intriguing because it's almost as if this thing wants to be remembered in the collective memory banks because all of the trial records, all of the legal documents from that period are still with us and they're all available online and we can sort of see the names and find out the occupations of the people who were charged and involved. And it's not just some Dickensian underclass, you know, it's business owners and shop owners and all sorts of people just get out on the street. First of all, it starts off with Catholic churches, um, quarters that are known to have lots of the Irish populations all get ransacked and burnt, but then it all goes completely bonkers. And by the end of it, practically every prison in London has been opened up, all the prisoners have been released, they've been burnt to the ground. Buckingham Palace has been attacked, and down the street has been attacked. And you might think, how the hell, you know, why does it go on so long? Why don't people just come in and trash it straight away? And you've probably heard about the riot act. A magistrate was required to read the Riot Act out in public, and that basically <coughs> meant that if you didn't, if you were a group of more than a few people and you did disperse within a couple of hours, you could be fired upon. 
But in those days, everyone knew um, who everybody was, you see. It's like now in London, you've got these, these enormous great skyscraper buildings, these faceless, you don't even know who's in there, you don't know who owns them. You know, security moves you on if you didn't try and photograph them. In those days, everybody knew everything. So the first magistrate that reads out the right hands, we're going to come to that as they all been around his house, and there's this kind of protocol that they adopt that they take everything out of somebody's house and just burn it in the road. And this is what happened to the first magistrate. So it took a little while. But in the midst of it all, the spectacular conflagration, Newgate Prison, Newgate Prison it is opened up. I mean, they just go crazy. They set fire to it, and then they kind of think it's an afterfire. Bloody hell, there's a load of people in there, we burn them out before they get burned to death. So they managed to let a load of people out of this apocalyptic scene, an absolute apocalyptic scene. And 22 year old William Blake, who's out on the street, is caught up in the mall, and he's right there pretty much in the front row. And he experiences all of this. Now, you know, every author at the Glaston Positive Living Group, a lot of you, you know, that are in town, that are regulars here, I know that there are people who are above average levels of sensitivity. You know, you see stuff with your eyes open. You know, you feel stuff very deeply. Imagine what it'd be like if you were 22 years old in the middle of this crazy scene. You know, this absolute raging apocalypse. Imagine if you're William Blake. You know, imagine if you are somebody who, who as we've heard in these famous stories, you know, sees angels in a tree or has God knocking on his window at the age of 10 and is kind of permanently in this semi-visionary state. What kind of tumultuous effect is an experience like that going to have on you? You know, something like that could break you, you know, if you are a very psychically sensitive, emotionally sensitive person, something like that could wipe you right out. But it doesn't. The whole thing has to do with one of the bridges in London. As I say, it goes on for a week. In the end, London becomes an armed camp. There's about 15,000 soldiers in there. Uh, the final body count uh, varies from different sources. This is an absolute great book. It surprises me that people don't appreciate the fact that there are a lot of popular historians who are really good writers who are actually better writers than the novelists and, and before some of these academic historians disappeared up their post structuralist backsides, there are some really readable accounts of all this sort of stuff. This is a cold code I'm mentioning because it has significance in the cultural history that I'm unfolding here. And the title of it comes from some graffiti that was written on the walls of Newgate after it had been burned down. His Majesty King Bob. And I'll briefly jump ahead with the way that this kind of followed through. Um, in the 60s, there was a group of people in London who became aware of the book and everything about it, and it was a situationist group um, that would do stuff like put Blake or Feet or Walls or Susan Bowles that later, who took the name from that. And then, you know, there's actually the figure of King Moore in Grant Morrison's Invisibles. You know, there's actually a kind of um, chaos magic uh, hero in a popular comic who's named after King Moore. And, uh, you know, Grant Morrison, a very, very interesting guy, um, had some experiences that are up there in the Philip K. Dick category uh, out in um, the Malays, somewhere in the dark. And his King Moore character, it kind of gets semi autobiographical. He follows through on that. And the main, if you like, popular main, works all its way through. This is from the second series of Stranger Things that maybe some of you saw. There's just this stack full of all these 80s references. There's just the phrase King Mob, you know, there. So something kind of follows through, and we'll get into this a bit more in a moment. Poor old George Gilbert, you know, he's slung in a cell, you think that he's going to go down for life, but amazingly, he gets off. They let him out, but he's such a contentious guy, trouble just won't leave him alone. He knows Cagliostro as well. <coughs> part, part as a result, his association with Cagliostro and the things that put him ultimately in an Inquisition cell. Gilman goes back to jail. He could have got, got out of there, I believe, but he, he, he stuck to his guns. And he ended up in jail, converted to Judaism. You know, this is quite a strong point. This is quite important in terms of the extent to which the book 
father is influenced in all of this people. It's a girl who dies in jail. It's very sad. But this is where, you know, it's a very, very important from my thesis, great like, you know, ideas come in. This is my even very famous, most well known image, actually, a punky that was cold on Glad Day in Dolstow, people that I believe was possibly didn't actually call it that himself, it was called that by a, a later catalogue of his work. But there's an earlier version of it, which is this drawing. And he actually starts work on this, and that the first version of it that you see is often up to print and sale, is sometime afterwards. He starts work on this in the same year as Gordon Rice. <coughs> so he comes out of that whole situation and he creates this, this image. Now we've already got this idea that Albion is a personification of the nation, if you like. Now Martha Shinshaw has put forward a very interesting <coughs> idea that that kind of spiky hair is, is actually an allusion to the celestial bed, the electrification, and uh, you know, Golden, something of golden, and something of, of this whole sex of mysticism is there in the background of the inspiration of Albion. Obviously, as he represents, you know, the body politic, if you like, the, the very soul of the nation, the, these elements are somehow there in that whole thing. Now, we know Blake as well is completely seduced with Kabbalah, and uh, Albion. Uh, and Kabbalist Adam Campbell uh, are, are pretty much you know, the same thing. And you can see on the image on the left, uh, it's in Poland, but so well, so later, that strictly speaking, in theory, this is a, a maphrodite bee. This is, has, has got all genders contained within it, although the version of the right is the one that people, you know, the occultists, uh, have got to be familiar with. Now, when I was commissioning Yuri, do the artwork for all of this, I went out my way to get him to work from uh, the drawing rather than the painting. I wanted to bring out that particular quality in the hair and the face of Albion as the kind of some kind of weird expression of everything that went into the eruption of the collective depths of the Golden Rites. And this is, you know, for those of you that have been blessed and read and have seen the, the front page of, of the August Oracle, you know, in the early stages of the artwork, we used that um, to represent it. So all of this is, is to me, absolutely uh, vitally important in my kind of evolving understanding of what Blake and, and his work are all about. And um, it goes through, you know, a comparative obscurity. There are people who know him. He's a bit of a cold figure, if you like. There are people that love him. There are people who live towards the end of his life that think of him as a kind of living saint. But simply to be in his company, some kind of blessing is conveyed. But when he dies, um, the process of how his work um, becomes disseminated is so that we can all know all partake of it is, is a torturous one, but it's a very intriguing one because the characters we make along the way because of the fact that we've been invited to see some kind of unity in their diversity because of the bloke that runs through it all. And one of the first things that, that is really annoying is the, you know, one of the people who's aiming his work afterwards really freaks out uh, the amount of erotic material there is in his art. This is from Milman. And the original artwork, you know, it's got stiffy, okay, but they put pants on it, man. I mean, it's just does my head in. You just got to just find a piece of this and give them a goddamn slap, really. This is sort of difficult that you, you get um, in terms of the understanding of what Blake is. But I've got to say a big, big yo um, to Alexander Gilchrist. Because he's Blake's first um, major biographer, and I get a bit emotional uh, whenever I kind of contemplate Gilchrist. It's almost like a Dickensian situation because he's a young guy in his 20s who's written a biography of some obscure figure and is commissioned on that basis to uh, you know, do his portfolio project that is to write Blake's biography. And he's taken up quite a million of this. 
But he's got a body constitution, he's got a uh, full kit. He gets that far with it, and they look like tragedy. One of his kids gets scarlet fever, he nurses the child. The child survives, but he goes down with scarlet fever and dies at the age of 33 with the work incomplete. And his wife, Anne, who has been helping him uh, a lot, um, she steps in and with some considerable help um, some people who make the moment they actually get the thing out there. Now, it's often suggested you know, there's no copies uh, of, of the kind of manuscript that show the handwriting whereby we can tell who does how much. She always gave credit to her husband. It has been suggested that she did quite a lot herself. But the fact that this is all out there is due to and then that Gabriel was there. Um, you know, we know him for putting himself about town a bit, we know him for being in the pre like brotherhood. Some of us know him as another war mass. Some of us have even discovered the fact that he kept uh, a token uh, and a llama and then he made a bit of a cowboy hat with a token and then he used to get a token to ride on the back of the llama and go around to Liverpool while he was a big He's very much playing a bit in Liverpool as well. So, but this is your point as. This is your pre-Raphaelite sort of characters. Rosette is extremely important along with his brother, William Michael, who's an art critic. When he's under 19, that go to Rosette, he probably knows a little bit about blood. And he's able to procure, what I always like to think of it as he's kind of got the order of some kind of drug deal about it. He meets up with Samuel Paul and Piper in the British Museum. And he's got this incredible manuscript of Blake's and Rosette buys it off him. Now, you know, it's now come to Rosette manuscript, absolutely flipping incredible. It's got a whole bunch, about 170 pages in it. There are, this is, I don't know if you can see that, it's the first draw of the tiger. There are varying versions of poems in it. He's gone all the way through this notebook, he's had it for over 10 years, but he's finished it, he's just kind of turned it upside down and worked through it backwards, which is all a bit strange. But it's, it's a gold mine. It's a ton of gold mine for Blake. And one of the things that's really intriguing on the kind of cultural studies level is the fact that in there, uh, Blake has, as well as all these poems and drawings and stuff, he has quite a lot to say about the state of art. And he has a right old dig at the old establishment that he's been you know, brought up here in the 18th century, Paul Reyes, Joshua Reynolds, all this kind of stuff. And Rosette really takes this on board, and Rosette's brother said that, that what Rosette read in the Blake manuscript was, was pretty formative towards his family and pre Raphael. Literally the next year, you know, he gets his manuscript in 1947, and he or be his family in 1848. So that's kind of incredible. And both Rosette brothers are, are held tremendously in, in the Gilchrist two volumes that, that come out. You know, they're, they're, absolutely vital in the dissemination of blood. And then we've got this guy, we've got Algin, Algin on Swindle, who is also somebody, you know, many of you know, uh, is a painter, he's hanging out with the PLBs as well. And he's not, he's not this standard 19th century type, and as much as he puts out a story that he had sex with a monkey and then killed it and ate it. <laughs> now I think that, that Swindler will be a natural for the Twitter age because that would be a hell of a twit. Fuck some monkey, you killed it, that's it. And I will ask Swindler the pub. You know, I think he would have got a few RFLs and I would have enjoyed a few good tweets out there. But Oscar, Oscar Wilde, the president said Swindler was all about the trousers. He never really did after she talked about it. But it was a very sensitive man, you know, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and if you know his poetry, quite an influence on House of Crowley. Some people don't like his poetry. I love his poetry. There's stuff from classic things. Anybody that is interested in Sappho and all of those kind of subject matters, <laughs> Swindler and brings this to the fore. There's poems about Aphrodite and so on that are very, very, um, very beautiful as far as I'm concerned. And he latches on to Blake uh, as a man who is engaged in you know, one of the buzz things of the time, after our son. That Blake is somebody that, has, as we know, 
world is created, his own system world would be, you know, just slave by another. And he doesn't take, you know, like David Erdman, who's got this immense amount of historical context, where Bird just takes blank on another level. Uh, and it's very interesting to read, it doesn't. Well, let's go again. It does a critical essay. Now, when you think of an essay, you just think, I don't know, 10 pages, 20 pages, this thing's nearly 400 pages long. You know, but it, it's really worth reading because remember, and has this extreme sensitivity and his portrayal of Blake's personality and also what the work's all about. <coughs> he kind of went into it because Gilchrist had felt that he was not up to the task of understanding what he could have prophetic books. And Swinburne kind of feels he's going to take that off. To be honest, I don't really feel it does. But I really love um, the work that he's done there. Um, and he's another important figure in, in the lineage, the hand down of things. Right at the end of the 19th century, this fantastic anthology uh, concerning mystical states of consciousness by Richard Boris about cosmic consciousness comes out. It's, it's, it's still a classic, you know. I would recommend that really anyone interested in these kind of subjects reads this. You know, that and William Jones Wright is a religious experience and that was his perennial philosophy. They're, they're justifiable classics. The thing that's, that's interesting about Buck is that he um, includes Blake very much amongst all of the great mystics. You know, he's dealing with, with Jesus and Buddha and Plotinus and, and so on. But he's also dealing with poets uh, and, you know, John and across the whole crew. But he's put Blake firmly in there and he's kind of almost given him a kind of his own grading system. You know, we can argue with all of that, but the important thing is that he's put Blake up there in the first rank. <laughs> and this book, you know, it, it's ex almost absurdly optimistic, bearing in mind that the First World War is just 20 years away. But when, we, you know, we come back round to it, this, this book became very popular in the 60s and justified it. So it's, it's, it's a great read. And the thing is, what we've got by then, the Resetting Brothers, Mel Gilchrist, Swimmers on board, W.B. Yates is also uh, a person who's, who's been able to bring understanding of the kind of occult mystic source material that has been working with. Hedge chimed in in the 1890s, and there's Buck. And there is this. <coughs> Comfortable 
It's not comfortable about it, and there comes a point that it's first premiered in 1916. It's not all that long before he withdraws permission for it to be used by the fight for right. Now, this is Miss Fawcett. Um, everyone ought to know she is, but I'm not really making that many people that do. Um, extraordinary woman. When we think of suffragettes, we think of Pankhurst, we think of all these dramatic tactics. You know, Emily Davis and Diane and the Darby and Full Stadium and bombs and all kinds of crazy shit. But there's another group that was, um, you know, the Sun calls the National Union of, of Women's Suffering Societies. And Minister Fawcett was, was head of that for some considerable time, and they were like, that bit more moderate. But she had already achieved um, big things, you know, in the early first years of the century. With the Boer War going on, there's this terrible situation in South Africa where the British government has initiated what we, what we would call concentration camps, that's what they were calling them at the time. And the policy was, you know, the Boer farmers were out in their guerrilla banks fighting the British, so the British were burning their farms down and taking their wives and children into captivity and corralling them all together. And there was another amazing woman called Emily Hobhouse who went out there and exposed the terrible conditions there. You know, there's 45 camps, uh, 26,000 people um, in a period of 18 months died in these camps. And of those 26,000, almost all of them were aged under 16. Now, this, this is just neglect and stupidity and, and callousness rather than out and out genocide. But this was publicised in Britain, and they all, you know, Minister Fawcett was actually sent out to investigate on behalf of the government's report. And she did this, she's the first woman to ever, ever uh, been put in a situation like that um, by a government uh, that they would you know, send her out and accept whatever she had to say broadly. And she worked tirelessly for a whole load of real controversial stuff, um, dealing with child abuse, uh, criminalising incest. Um, there was also a whole deal about prostitutes being false to be examined for sexually transmitted diseases that the people that were their customers were. And there was a whole imbalance there. She worked for all this stuff, okay? And she's recognised for that. You know, this is actually aimed from this year. There's a whole statue unveiled to her uh, in Parliament Square, and I chose that photograph of her. Another one that the Theresa May was visible in because I didn't think that was entirely appropriate. But here's the thing you see. Minister Fawcett approaches Hubert Parry and asks for his permission to use the Jerusalem for the women's suffrage movement. And he readily agrees. And you know, it's kind of interesting because there are there is a certain amount of disquiet in some quarters in this day. You know, certainly blasphemy about Jerusalem and about what people think it means and about its connection to you know, Zionism and the actual city of Jerusalem and a certain amount of discomfort. But right from the go, there's a tension there. That tension between the fight for right and the jingoism and then the adoption by the women's movement. And Harry signs over the rights to this in perpetuity. It becomes um, you know, the act that also the Women's Institute uh, for as long as there was copyright on it. So there's this kind of thing of the female in Jerusalem, and it's very important when we come to understanding the way Jerusalem makes. But it gets complicated right from the go, because the First World War is going on, and in 1917, uh, General Allenby uh, captures the physical Jerusalem. And there were a lot of soldiers from Somerset there. This thing was reported in, in local newspapers that it was a real big deal. And people thought there was some kind of biblical event, and they got all, all millennial. All that kind of stuff was going on in relation to it. And it's in this kind of context that of a weird story that has kind of been bubbling up a little bit, really sort of rises to the surface. The 1920s is the, the kind of paint period where the Jesus blasphemy story comes in. The idea that as a young boy, he comes here with Joseph Graham there, and this is what Blake's actually talking about in the words of Jerusalem. Now, our very own Mr. Paul Ashdown uh, wrote this absolutely stupendous book that amazes me and people 
which I've not talked to, that exists, that exists, came out in 2010. This, my friends, is the absolute definitive consideration of this whole business. And what it boils down to is it is very, very difficult to pen this story down here. You know, this form's being called more than Jesus came to this country. 1895 may have been the original forms of it a little bit earlier, but actually taking it back to Simon Blake himself is astoundingly difficult. And, and this is what I say about this liminality. It's almost as if there's something that doesn't want us to be able to be definitive about it. It's almost as if there's something that makes us have to approach it on another level of cognition. Yeah, there are people, very few people in Glastonbury, who are very clear that this is true and that Jesus is really coming in. I'm not saying that isn't true. But I'm saying you cannot prove it, so what you have to do is you enter into that potion of soul instead. And what it is about that, the, the resonance. Just jump ahead, the whole influence of blood and the people that transmit is current. Adam Ginsburg. Yeah, I don't have any of you have seen this film of the young Ginsburg, Kiri Dobbins, with Danny Radcliffe as Ginsburg. Fantastic film. We're pretty much going back to that period of time, you know. This, this is, this, even at a young age, it still does my head in that Ginsburg, William Burroughs, and Jack Kerouac had all met up around the scene, around the university that Ginsburg was at. And Radcliffe is, is, you know, looking pretty good for him in there. It's, it's, it's a, a, a great performance. Now, quite often, if you go around the internet and you look at new sites and so on, you get things formatted in this list. You know, uh, tell me like this, tweet like that, uh, and social media marketing gurus will tell you that if you get more hits to your site, you'll create some lists and so on. Well, I'm going to play our list now. Great wanks of history. Wanks that change the world. You know, I, I've discussed this topic with you know, the coffee houses of Glastonbury, and I guess James Joyce, you know, the whole Ulysses deal. The fact that the guy's got a statue built to himself in a Catholic country and uh, you know, it's virtually a national holiday, <coughs> it all demands your fair play to him on that. But I will put forward um, Adam Ginsburg in a category all of his own for what I'll now describe as the William Blake Blank. It's, it's a couple of years after Kimmy Dolly's. <coughs> it's 1948, and Ginsburg is still only 22. And he's in Harlem, it's a hot summer night, the likes of Burroughs and Kerouac are not about. So, you know, he just does what anybody does in a situation like that, gets his book of poetry out and starts masturbating. <laughs> you know, we, we, we've all been there, guys, you've been a bit frisky. You know, where's my book of poetry? <laughs> my, my book of money is clear. Well, maybe not. You know, Ginsburg. It tells, it tells a lot of still different versions of that. There are some non gaudy versions. I'll, I'll spare you the, the real icky details. But sufficient to say that he's idly masturbating on William William Blake. And then he hears a voice in the room. And it's not a voice like it's in his head, it's outside his head. And it's reciting an entire William Blake poem. And, and another two poems are recited. And Although here and there, when you read the different accounts, he, he, he occasionally suggests that maybe it might have been a mature version of himself, he pretty much takes the ball that it was William Blake. And that in that moment, some kind of mantle was passed up to him. And his entire poetic vocation, he's already a poet, but the real serious business of what his life is all about is determined in that moment. And he stays in a very, very strong state of consciousness, uh, which he tests out. You know, he gets a book of mystical writing by something like Plotinus of the bookshelf, and he reads about it, and the minute he's read it, he's gone into the state that has been described. He's in, in a state he's never read in before, and he feels like, whatever this is all about, I can't ever forget it. This is the absolute fundamental bedrock of the whole of my life. He comes down off it inevitably. A couple of days later, he's in a bookshop in New York and he's, he's gets a book of poetry, Blake again. Yeah, he's in a bookshop, so he can't start having a wank, but he does go into a pretty strange state of consciousness. 
where he starts staying on the paper around him and got animal heads. And, and it's like these animal heads are indications of some deeper state of consciousness where their emotion consciousness is at, where their emotion blocks are, what's stopping them from experiencing the divine splendor. Uh, and you know, Ollie goes with this. And right fine comes to it, there's a whole lot of turbulence now to try and the psychiatric hospital, but he writes an owl and he becomes, you know, the great advocate of the third generation. And then he finds his way to India. This is this is 1963, and he's starting to look like we recognise, you know, the archetypal Anne Ginsberg with the bushy beard and so on. And what's fascinating about this Indian trip is that he's in the city of Krishna, and he makes a female saint who actually tells him that William Blake is his guru. And for people that kind of have an understanding of, of the guru tradition, people that might have been part of all this in certain respects themselves, to have got a connection to some sort of spiritual transmission, it doesn't just mean that you accept somebody as important in your life and your teaching. It means there's literally a kind of force that is working its way through, you know, they call it Shakti Power, Shakti Kundalini, or whatever, but there's something a bit out of the ordinary that is going on in it. And, and Ginsburg takes us on board. Flash forward to May 65, he's um, complained the King of the May, he checks the back here, I think he's then um, burnt down the country on the basis of that. But this is the same year that you've probably all seen in the Bob Dylan video for Subterranean Oversea Blows. Um, you know, he's just in the background uh, there on the left. 1965. Now, this is a little bit late, but we found. Um, thanks to David Walker's collection, his, his late father's collection of photos. This is Ginsburg outside the Georgian Pilgrim uh, during the days of the famous hippies, not in many. It's, we, can't, we haven't yet figured out when this was because this is, is going to be late 60s and then into the 70s. But for the sake of my narrative, I've got him here in Glastonbury because he came here in May 65 and I mentioned this. Uh, yesterday when I was in the Abbey at Arthur's Grave because he went into Glastonbury Abbey and he picked a flower at Arthur's Grave uh, to send back to New York uh, to his lover, Peter Obloski and it's part of a kind of almost a Kerouacian hitchhiking odyssey he started from Bristol, hitchhikes to Wells Cathedral inside to Glastonbury he ends up in Cambridge uh, examining some original like manuscripts and in an interview uh, in a magazine in 1966, as well as talking about the original Blake Impetus in 1948, he talks about his visit to Glastonbury. He talks about his disillusionment with the conventional forms of revolt and rebellion that you've got in straightforward Marxism, and how Blake's Albion in Jerusalem in a man is, is like something that is potentially inspiring him. So he's come to Glastonbury in 65, he's got all of his influences on board. 1967 is a very interesting year for Ginsburg in terms of, of the Blakey aspect of it and, and how the weak connections with it seem to, to resonate out into the bigger body poly. This is January the full name the famous human being, the start of the hippie year in San Francisco Garden Park. Park. And you know, many of us have seen pictures of him there with some familiar he's just entering full full ass of guru mode at that point, you know, he's been talking to Marshall McLuhan about the fact that he needs a snappy slogan. So this is when he really starts <coughs> going forward with the old term machine and drop out. This is a big event. But later on in the year in July, Ginsburg comes to, to Brennan, comes to London and he's there on Primrose Hill and he's there deliberately because of the Blake Associations. And in Sinclair, young in Sinclair filled in, and there's a DVD of you know, Our Sunflower, which is an absolute classic, uh, which has got Ginsburg on, on Primrose Hill, and it is very much a snapshot of a very distinct era of time. He's it, reading his own poetry, he's reading Blake poetry as well. And from there, and bear in mind this is 67, bear in mind that we, we started off, you know, with Leary, Golden Gate Park, Ginsburg is already taken acid, Ginsburg is already an advocate of acid. But in the whole of 67, he hadn't taken any acid at all up to the point where he went wild. And he's got a tip of and he's obviously a bit of Wordsworth. And 
and at this point, out in the middle of nowhere, he takes LSD and, and has this full on Wordsworth experience. And he also, you know, he writes a poem while he's coming down off it. There's a fantastic bit of film footage. Um, you can find it on YouTube from 1968, where he's on an American chat show and he's actually telling the chat show host about his experience of taking LSD and writing this poem. He reads the poem out. And although it is very Wordsworthian, uh, he mentions Blake, he mentions the concept of the barge, you know, this is something that I explore um, in the book a lot more. But it's just a few months later that he comes back to America and he's, he's, he's already thinking about playful forms of protest now. You know, certain forms of protest actually buy into the very thing you're protesting against. You get locked into this kind of um, whole structure and how to avoid that. And part of all this ends up with other people out there as, as the the legendary uh, anti Vietnam War demonstration where the, the, the ceremonies were supposed to be trying to raise the Pentagon and expel the demons. Those are the iconic images. You know, this is a 17 year old girl um, in front of these beds here, and you know, the flowers down the gun barrels. This is all you know, absolutely iconic. And here's Ed Sanders uh, from the Fox, who I'm sure some of you at least would know in their early albums. You know, Blake Blake enthusiasts, there are some recordings of Blake's songs by the folks. And he's the guy that gets the, the ceremony together, um, which there is, there is audio on that, you can find out on YouTube, it's an absolute hoop, I quote quite a bit in the book. And, and Annie Hoffman, you know, the founder of the, the year piece, the youth of the national <coughs> All of this is, is so mate, I see it's a unit. When I, when I see 67, I see Ginsburg at the beginning of it, with Leary at Gold Gate Park, the end of it with the demonstration at the Pentagon. Thirdly, in the middle of this is his visit to London and his one connection with, with, with Blake and what that's all about. And I think this, this plays out even more in 1968 because there is the, the Democratic High Convention that famously turns into pretty much a police riot. The whole crew are out again, the Yippies, Ginsburg, everybody, and they're trying to sort of. Um, keep the surrealism going, so they, they, oh, I'm a half hour there, are we? No, no, I was just... Uh, all right, okay. Uh, they decide to run a, a pig as a presidential candidate. Now, you know, they've done all sorts of things that never been noticed in a minute. They bring uh, the legendary Pegasus to Chicago and unleash it, you know, they're arrested, so it's all over the newspapers. And a whole bunch of people turn out to find style for this. And I love this photo because this is Ginsburg and Sean Germain uh, standing by while William Burroughs do, you know, shakes hands about the off them. You know, this is the kind of stuff that's, that's going on. And they deliberately kept their protest in a, in a park a little away from where the Democratic uh, Convention was being held. Because there were so many places around it, it was kind of obvious the whole thing was going to you know, go ahead and then they had passing very quickly. And Ginsburg's got his people gathered around in the park and he's chopping on and all the rest of it. But yeah, it, got, it, it, it all kicks off. It all kicks off at the end of August 1968 and turns into this, this legendary riot where there is a, a lot of footage. You know, media people have been up by the place. There's no argument about it. But on the cast, Ginsburg recites um, a poem by Blake, the Great Monk, which there's a couple of different versions of it, but it dates from the time when Blake was, was put on trial, one of the most traumatic events in his life after he had an altercation with a soldier, and ran the risk of going, not just going to prison, but maybe getting to be deported to Australia or who knows what. And it's all about tyranny, it's all about the way a certain mindset is oppressive. And Ginsburg sings this song, uh, the song from Blake, uh, with a churn that came into his head a couple of weeks before now. When it comes to how this whole Black Festival has come together, you know, we, we worked out the King Arthur Park when there was a clear date that we had in the event there on Friday, August the 10th, uh, you know, tomorrow I was out for that. And it was while I was writing my material on Alan Kingsbury, and I realised that I started writing his birthday without being conscious of it. That's always a good sign. Now I discovered in Ginsburg's diaries that the children for the great monk that he sung at the Chicago at the end of August 1968 came into his head on the way home from Neil Cassidy's funeral 
on August 10th, 1968. So tomorrow night is exactly 50 years to the day since Ginsburg got the church with great monkeys in. And he has, you know, there's a version of it, we can hear him singing that tune. So it's so absolutely bleeding obvious, someone's got to do that, haven't they? Mm -hmm. and, and very nervous tomorrow, Ty has jumped in mm -hmm. and I anticipate some splendid stuff tomorrow night, you know, so they'll measure the way all this stuff hangs together. So yeah, right, and at the end of it all, there's this, this legendary trial of the Chicago 8 that becomes the Chicago 7. Bobby Seale, the black guy, is tied to a chair and gathered <coughs> in the courtroom. Can you imagine that shit happening now? You know, absolutely extraordinary. The whole crusade is going on for 50 years. It's a legend, you know, there's been a few movies, a few plays about it. About 10 years ago, Spielberg was going to do a movie on it, but it was going to be some square right strike. He was actually going to have Sasha Baron Cohen as Andy Hoffman, um, and Will Smith was by the movie Bobby Seale. I think that would have been pretty goddamn extraordinary, but it's, it's a huge thing. And with this 50 years old, it just seems something very mysterious is coming back round again with, with full power. At the same time, there's a group in London calling themselves King Ball. They're situationists, they're kind of surrealist pranksters and anarchists, if you like, and they're putting up these, um, you know, blatant graffiti. It's not the only graffiti they're doing, but they're putting this up around London and engaging in various, various pranks and getting involved in demonstrations. They're around somewhere in the background in the Vietnam protests in London. And, you know, the stuff is all out there for people that want to find out about it. Uh, a lot of information is there, you just got to kind of be interested in it in the first place somehow. And one of the people that was around during that period of time, they did a little stunt in 68, they went in the self just dressed as far as Christmas, a whole bunch of them, and handed out toys to kiddies in there before they were stopped by the security guards. Malcolm McLaren tells the story that he was there, he was part of all of this, he was part of it, he saw it and he was inspired by it. And this is where we go into, you know, the strange follow through of the energy of the Gordon Rice. Because McLaren is somebody, uh, we know he was obsessed with Oliver Twist, apparently the only ill paper that he owned was, was the soundtrack of Oliver around about 1975. He wanted the Sex Pistols to be his detective urchins, and he wanted to be faking and this uh, insert that went into some copies of the Lemon Boris album, which is an illustration from Dickens, um, all of the twists and a whole bunch of the usual um, sex business stuff. And he wanted John Rotten to be, um, <coughs> you know, to be Oliver, but Oliver, but Lynn just wasn't having it. You know, Steve Jones was, was famous for being a bit of a thief, so he was the old dodger. And of course you've got the whole doom like Sid and Nancy, you know, literally as in the same stuff that you've got in all the twists, you've got Nancy, who, who is murdered, you know. There's a weird thing there, I'll, I'll, I'll say it's about Sid, but maybe he didn't do it. We'll give him, we'll give him a possibility there. But McLaren's got this very weird mindset, and at the very start of the rock and roll swing on one of it's not a very good screenshot. But he's actually recreated the Gordon Rice. He's actually on a horse, dressed in top and riding through with a firebrand. And these are refugees of the Sex Pistols being hung there. And somewhere in all of this, you know, I kind of realised uh, something that Fred Marcus had quite got. You know, this is the undercurrent. This is, is, is the voices that are somehow coming through. Um, John and the Six Pistols and that whole vibe. These guys, you know, you can say they're the Kensington Urchins, but they're also part of, of the 18th century mob. And as I was coming to this, again, the writing process, I was absolutely amazed to find online a 300 page thesis by some Australian academic called Mike Ewan Kinson uh, from the Six Pistols in the London mob. Now, sometimes when you find stuff like this, uh, you've got pay, shed loads of money to download it and all this, it's a right pain in the head. But downloading the whole lot of it for free, read the whole lot of it, and, and was just utterly exhilarated by it. I recommend it to anybody who, who, who has any interest in this kind of thing. And as part of the whole culture that's coming through at the same time, now this is published by Gothic Image, you know, we see Blake's name on the cover there. This is an image from Derek Jarman's 
uh, Jubilee, which has got, you know, um, short day, as played by Richard O'Brien, bring in Elizabeth the first forward uh, to the punk era, and all kinds of populist economies is going on there. It's the moment it divides people, you know, the blue rays just come out. Uh, it's kind of, they all right, okay. And, you know, again, what's the truth about this to me? Adam Ames and Matt Burley. And, you know, Adam Ames most um, iconic, you know, form, if you like. It's very late in the century, isn't it? You know, you don't necessarily clock it in quite that way. When you put it alongside a whole load of other strange nuances, it becomes quite interesting. And Malcolm McLaren's funeral, you know, he said, Malcolm McLaren, he was the French Revolution, he was, he was ghost killed, he was dead, he was the terror. So all of those references are all the century. We know the McLaren was completely obsessed with the London Bull. And then, then there was another project that got involved in the Ghost of Oxford Street, uh, which is out there on Channel 4 Catch Up, if you still want to see it. And in that one, you've got the Happy Mondays being taken to Tyburn uh, to be home as high. Pretty damn strange. Well, all of that to say, it just goes around in cycles and circles, and when certain events of body and body demand it, you know, it, it rises to the surface again. And it's very, very intriguing to see this year uh, that these guys, the White Block, have, have manifested in London and have made their presence known, you know, in marches against uh, Tommy Robinson uh, and against Trump and so on, and it's an absolute gas that we've got, you know, one of these contingent areas tonight, but, that, you know, it's all being cross-fertilised. It's very, very intriguing uh, what's going on. <clears throat> but now, you know, I don't know why I'm going to appear, the glass that we notice is what the hell, guys, you know, what am I talking about? <laughs> Another one of these blokey issues was like the Druid. There are Druid orders, there's a Druid order, says, yeah, Blake was here, they're all there. Ross Nichols said this. You know, he, he said that Blake's trial, you know, you know, free for this thing, the soldier, he said, oh, about taking an oath and I'm a druid. But Ronald Hart has gone through all the records for this, it's nothing, it's not true. It's just another one of these things. And yet there's a druid order that makes just up the road from where he was living, uh, during the period of time of, of the real manifestation of druid revival, thanks to this character out of the gang week who oh, is somebody that feeds on the same antiquarian mythology that they feeds on. Um, you know, there's no question about that at all. And there's a kind of convergence on Primrose Hill, because I know created a druid or this revived, created, and whatever you want to think of it as. And they started making, still do to this day on Primrose Hill, and there's this, you know, a plot that commemorates that. And, of course, there's the famous quote from Blake about conversing with spiritual sun, soil, or primrose hill, and that is likewise, you know, all kind of brought down. Uh, and the two somehow kind of converged there. And what I think is really interesting, you know, we, we know, for example, um, that they're fading on the same influences, that they're very much in the same place. And there's even one interpretation, one essay by a Blake scholar, that suggested that maybe part of the meaning of that spiritual sun quote is actually Blake kind of referred to that, that he was there for that ceremony. I don't know about that, but it's an interesting idea. And this is where we move from to Glastonbury, and this is where we go into what I'm quite clear I haven't been making here. There's no question about that's what I'm doing, but I find it interesting. We've got this whole thing here, we call it the Glastonbury Zodiac, or, or the Temple of the Stars, and the sculptures Catherine Morewood. Uh, came to believe um, in the late 20s and the early 30s that there's literally a uh, vast old cakes of effigies and the landscape there, and that they mark out broadly the signs of the zodiac. Now, what's intriguing to me is when you look at her bibliography, is that she is actually taking stuff from books that are really, really out of date. In fact, they're so far out of date that the same books that William Blake was using. Uh, as part of his source of material, there's a guy called um, Jacob Bright who wrote a system of comparative mythology that basically suggests that all mythology comes out of the Bible, uh, all every single form of mythology is based on the Old Testament. And this is out of date, probably, virtually, when Blake was using this, it came out in 1776. Morewood uses this, 
And she also uses some works on Lord Druidism that came out at you know, 1809, that there's no way Blake would have been aware of, that Fee told me by Alan Gambling. Now, Mary Kane, even more so, she first hears about the place to be Zodiac while she's in a Druid order. You know, she, all this book, Ross Nichols has kept a whole lot of material uh, about this that he's written. And if you read this book, in many respects, it's pure Alan Gambling. You know, it's like out in the landscape, there is an eye over the Gambling mystical playground. All the stuff out here, the dollar and the, the, the three pillars of the island symbol, is all right there in the landscape. And this is the centre of uh, Sagittarius that's painted by um, Osmond Kane, the husband of Mary Kane. Not only plastic it because it's forming in the pub side at the moment, and we've actually, I think, got the only really original painting in here tonight. One of the things that really fascinated me, you know, knowing people and, and investigating the stories of people that were around in the 60s, there was a great Avalonian called um, Tony, um, Tony Roberts. He wrote a lot of stuff on the glass of the Zodiac. He was a great bloke enthusiast and legendarily died of a heart attack on the slopes of the tour in 1990. Well, back in 71, he and his wife Jan were up on top of the tour. At the time that the first of the major film festivals playing out the one that's immortalised in the mood of Glastonbury Fair, the first real bigger. And they, they'd gone up on the tour to literally look over in the direction where the festival was to see if they could see it. And Jan actually saw rising up out of the ground this enormous titanic form of this alpha figure, you know, made out of earth with grass and like right up into the sky. Only very briefly. But she saw it. She saw it at the same time that the festival was on. She saw it in the same year that Geoffrey Ash published Canada and the Vision of Albion. And this kind of thought that Arthur, the Titan, you know, Arthur was being, uh, the tales of Arthur being part of the tales of Albion, the right to a fifth century priest. It seemed to be something very mythological stirring in this. Now, Mary Kane's most famous. Um, development of the theories is because she did an aerial survey. Um, she spotted in the Gemini figure where the head is. Um, what looks like the face of Christ it does, you know, there's no question about it. And it's, not, it's around the area of Dundon Beacon, and the beacon is right where the full river will be, and in her etymology, you can never trust the etymology of people who write about Jews and stuff, but she reckons Taliesin with radiant brow. So the earlier version by Baldwood, which is kind of like a, a sacred child, is kind of commingled with another version. And she thinks of Blake's words, that, you know, did the countenance divine? And she takes this to be a sign of the truth of that legend. And that's kind of very interesting because it's like, even if William Blake never met with Iola McGamwick, um, it's like he somehow met with him in the landscape here and the whole set of influences that they were on. When I was in the Abbey, you know, yesterday, I was reading from something called the Descriptive Catalogue. Like, you know, there's a great lost painting called the Ancient Britons, which um, dates to 1909 and was about Arthur's last battle. And well, that's a tragedy, we've lost it, we've got this gold mine of the Descriptive Catalogue where he talks about these weird ideas about Arthur. This is where you first get the quote about the deeds of Arthur being the deeds of Albion and so on. And it's absolutely clear that he, he knows about Iolo's work because he's based his painting on the Welsh Triad, which is one of the ones that Iolo's published. And the next one in the sequence is the one that talks about Glastonbury being a perpetual choir. It's very flippant mysterious. But there is, you know, it's all nuance. It's all kind of something that's just it seems to be deliberate somehow that we are not supposed to be able to pin it down, but it sets you off on this kind of mode. Now, my man Andy Collins, you know, this is out of BBC, he's so got a psychic back in 1906, by the way. Engaged in an incredible adventure with Glastonbury Zodiac in the 1980s. And part of that involved the, the fact that he was given this kind of information that he was looking for a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And he was ultimately led to Dunham Bacon. You know, we've got this image of, of the head of Christ there. And he eventually met somebody, quite a mysterious local inhabitant, who told him that Golgotha was uh, a name of something that Dunham Bacon has. 
Now, had they, you know, went into this visionary journey in the Glastonbury Zone and, and later on made a group of people to do likewise. So, you know, I've talked about this and written about this in my own in New York. I came to get this failing, you know, this thing with the head of Christ, this thing with Golgotha. Mike's got this idea called Golgonusa, which is the city of the imagination. You know, and it's something that's kind of co terminus with this vision of Jerusalem in, in London and so on. But it's a particular kind of zone that you get into. And I began to contemplate the Glastonbury Zodiac as a kind of Glastonbury Golgonusa, that there's a whole sort of living tableau of, of the kind of mythology that embodies the ideas that we like, that is available you know, to us if we enter into it in the right way. Which is why I don't think I'm going to be out there for any of us. Gallop along. Nicholas Rurin, who I mentioned on him a little while back, believed that art is a treasure of humanity uh, that we should respect. And uh, when wars break out, just as you've got a red cross flag, so you should also have uh, an image that in some way encapsulates the sanctity of the place. Cathedral, an art gallery, whatever. And he found this image on his travels out to Central Asia, this ring of the three dots in, and he managed to actually get his government, the United States included, to sign up to this banner of place in 1935. Didn't do it too well during the Second World War, but it's an idea that's just not been let go and it's come back into circulation again. And this is the iconic image of the Don Orif Lama. I wondered about all of this. You know, uh, it's there in the background as I started to contemplate. Glastonbury Abbey and its, its desolation, and the fact that um, once upon a time, you know, our lady of Glastonbury uh, was firmly established there. And I started thinking about the concept of the Shekinah in Judaism and the idea that there is a divine feminine element that we have it in the Temple of Solomon. And when the Temple was destroyed, that somehow departed. And it's a big deal with Judaism that they pride for the return. And it's not like checking I was banished from the universe where people are still, you know, connect with her. But there is some kind of time that will come when she returns. And this is when I ended in what I call a waking Jungian train. Because right next to the Catholic Church is Cotton Beach. And when does my class to be so I can jump feel no, that this is where Carl Gustav Jung and his wife Emma came and stayed in 1939. It's right next to the Catholic Church. And the foundation stone of that Catholic Church was actually laid in 1939. And Geoffrey Ash, who we've already met, wrote this incredible book, and I've obviously chosen the edition of it that's got the great image of the cover deliberately, on the cover of the Virgin Mary, which brings in a whole context surrounding you know, the goddesses of the classical world and the extent to which it's pretty obvious that they find their way. Some of them survive in the background of the cult version of Mary and that remains inspiration. Jeffrey Ash, you know, is a leader of the Catholic Church. He wrote this book when he was going into that Catholic Church, you know, every single, um, every single Sunday. And the statue of Our Lady Glastonbury that was created and sanctified in 1955 is, is based on the design of a uh, seal of the medieval abbey. And I start to get a faith that there's a whole kind of area about 200 metres north that is it's just filled with mystery uh, in terms of, of what I'm calling the return of Shekinah. Mm -hmm. This is a couple of my book out of this. I've dealt with the subject of Shekinah a lot in there. To really kind of gather through it, it's this, this sense that there is this divine feminine in Judaism. And it's come about because in the days of Solomon, uh, there was a lot of kind of mingling between the Jewish kings uh, and treaties, multiple wives from other kingdoms, a kind of like goddess of Ashtabar, who embodies, you know, connects to a whole lot of other pagan goddesses of the Middle East, uh, you know, Ishtar's, the Nanas, the Stales, uh, Aphrodite, they're all somewhere in the family. She's installed in the Temple of Solomon for well over half the amount of time it's up there, like keep moving around, she comes back in again. She's God's wife. You know, there's, there's plenty of archaeology and documentary evidence to suggest that that is how an awful lot of people saw at the time. We've got the post exilic voices in the Old Testament that kind of drag that out, the God's wife. 
So there is this kind of sense of this divine feminine that, that survives. And in particular, vision rates, you know, she's such a big deal in the Kabbalah. Um, Sins and Dorse Moravians introduced the Shekinah into the hymns that they sung for every sight. You know, this is all somewhere maybe in Blake's mother's ear. And there are visionaries, there are people that had experiences of it down for history, they're examples in the 18th century. Now, I mentioned cosmic consciousness and Maurice Butt, one of the things, well, mentioned Maurice Butt, one of the things that he says about flight is very interesting. It's that Blake felt that the, the law of Jerusalem was the, the most, the greatest part in the world, the most important thing that he'd ever written because he didn't really write it. He just took dictation of it. He just took 30 lines at a time down. He just wrote it down. It's come from somewhere else altogether. Now, one of the categories of the Shekinah vision is, you know, you, you spell in English is in a double G I D. Uh, it's a particular type of vision where you take dictation of, of material directly from the Shekinah sermons, books, whatever. Now, it's my contention that Blake is a functioning as uh, a magic. And the thing about Jerusalem. Jerusalem is quite clear what he says. Jerusalem is a city as his own woman. You know, Jerusalem is the emanation of the giant Albion. Jerusalem, in my opinion, is quite, I, I think it's pretty clear that on one level at least, because all these things are multi leveled, I can take Jerusalem as a shekin on. And in terms of what's going on in Glastonbury, uh, there is a sense that our version of the shekin if you like, departed with the destruction and dissolution of the monasteries and the abbey. Some people think the abbey is going to be rebuilt and the city of the New Jerusalem is coming back. Uh, I think that's a misperception, you know, there's an awful lot of importance of sacred geometry and all that sort of stuff. I love its places. I've done plenty in that world myself. But I think, you know, Shekinah has been coming back for some considerable time. Uh, she's already present in the multifaceted goddess movement. And you've got a whole area from where Goddess House is, and then you've got the, the actual Catholic Church, the Statue of Our Lady of Glastonbury. As if to emphasise it's a waking Jungian dream, you've actually got the place where Jung himself came and stayed at the same year that the foundation of the church today. Jung has a lot to say about how important it was that the Virgin Mary was enthroned against Queen of Heaven in the 1950s. He has a lot to say about what's going on in the collection of churches with that. And you move on to you know, the Magdalene Chapel. Uh, and or I should say that as part of the Magdalene Home Houses, the Malcolm Chapel, you've got a whole Mary Magdalene thing there. You've got a full spectrum. You've got a full spectrum going on. So this is what I've done when I've portrayed with the, the, the you know, same model space that was on our goddess, is on my version of Our Lady of Glastonbury as the Madonna of Lama, who is basically embodying uh, the return of the Shekinah and, and is a form of Jerusalem the kind of all of the sort of issues that people have got about the potential politics, Zionism, blah, blah, blah. Remember the background, remember how important people like Melissa and Fawcett were in bringing Jerusalem to our, our attention and in you know, bringing that emotional failing forward. Jose <coughs> Arquelis, I'm gathering now, we know, you know, we know that there is association with my character. We think there is a new age thinker. What's really important is that he starts off as a professional art history, a doctor of philosophy who teaches art history. And quite early on in the proceedings, um, he writes a book of the Transforming Vision. It's the first time that you see mention of 2012 and all this. He writes a whole chapter about William Blake. And he's got a vision that he's already figured out that there is this is a time when some you know, great place of art is psychedelic magicians going to arise through the planet, transforming reality through the power of their art, the evocation of their minds. For conscious artistic creations, they would tap the potential of human spirit, change the way they perceive themselves, and ultimately inaugurate the dawn of a new magic where the connected vision would change reality. That's absolutely clear, mate. This is what Blake's all about. Blake is one of these kind of characters. And Hosei, you know, if you just think of him, New Age, you kind of decontextualise it. There he is with Ginsburg. There he is with Tim Leary. He's part of all of that. Don't forget that he's a professor of art history and he's a theorist on art. All the way through all of this, you know, right up until the end when he just dissolves into his mythic identity. 
here's Woodstock, you know. I was like somebody who's been at Martin Luther King, the civil rights, I had a dream speech, he's there for the levitation of the, of the, of the Pentagon the demonstrations, he's aware of what masses of people can do with the white idea gets him. And he creates the whole Earth Festival, which is still going strong. And then he gets himself involved with crazy wisdom to better now than Chilton Trumper, who's a, a drunkard and organiser and a crazy ass mofo, but he's also got some very important stuff going on, as we will hopefully soon see. 87, the harmonic convergence, the new age would stop. Jose publicises the wine calendar, works out some dates that are acting on the basis of somebody else's theory. Everybody stakes out all these sites simultaneously. This is Glastonbury Tour. When we say Jose, so often he's got his mind calendar diagrams, it's all really complicated. Some of you probably remember this thing, the dream spell. What I say is, think of Jose as something like W. B. Yates creating a system like a vision. Think of Jose as something like Swedenborg and a visionary experience is going back and forth from planet to planet. Jose's got a critique of, of the global system. He's got this space, time is money. You know, he has a critique of our conventional calendar, uh, the 12 month year, the 60 minute hour, and so on. He says we've got natural time. If you investigate what he's got to say, it's very, very similar to Blake. You know, there are some very breaking nuances in this critique. And I think that if you just change the one words you use to describe people and their ideas, they have a different effect on you. And as I becomes very much part of Rurik's vision of art for pace. You know, he ends up in a Mexican pyramid being honoured by various shamans and my elders, and he's got a flag of Rurik's pace there, pace matter there. But coming back to the Chokster, you see, the Chokster has got this concept of Dharma art. Here's Ginsberg and Chokyan. And with Ginsberg's collaboration, they create the Naroba Institute, which is a kind of free flowing university. It has got a base, it has got a kind of canvas. But as part of it, Ginsberg suggests that Jack Kerouac's got the disembodied uh, poetry. And if you go on the website, it's a priceless archive because there is audio that you can spend weeks listening to that is Alan Ginsberg teaching courses on William Blake and reciting Blake poetry and talking about poetry of William Burroughs. And it's all under this idea of Dharma art that Chuck has got, that art of meditation conscious art. And you draw them all together, you know, in this, this idea. My feeling is, you know, my feeling is that what we've got with the Glastonbury Gnosis, this, this living kind of Iolo Blake playground of this return to Shekinah, it is a kind of something, it's already happening, there are already people that love Rurik and love Arguelles and work with the Glastonbury Zodiac and so forth, but I think we're becoming more and more conscious about that, that what we've got here is a kind of living treasure that is part of this enormous great process of which people like Jose and Rory to Ginsburg because of the very direct connection there to show us. And this is the brainstorm that I've had that is behind this Woody Blood Festival and is part of what you know I've put into this book at ridiculous pace, but I hope the intensity and passion that's going into it is, is effectively communicated in there. So I commend it to you, I commend this whole process to you. Next year we're hoping uh, to do uh, for the 50th anniversary of Woodstock, August 5th, 8th, 7th, 8th, to do a repay for this on a far larger scale and we're able to inspire people with all of these ideas. You know, my favourite is it's a really important time in the body politic right across the world, certainly in this country, certainly in America, and the words of Blake sing with great, great power, Young you. Absolutely beautiful. William Blake's life and the importance of his uh, spiritual journey and what he's given us is really manifest this week in Glastonbury. And uh, yeah, indeed. Thank you. Let's uh, open to some questions. Oh, yeah, I'll start my
as ever, that's going to be a, to the, uh, yeah, a, a, certainly a journey that will be beautiful. Um, I want to say that I'm sure most people here have seen the Nicholas Rowick uh, on YouTube that Paul did, uh, and all of you were indeed at it. Um, this one was very similar, wasn't it? I mean, each one built a yeah, yeah, Let's say something about some Yeah, it's cut by our attention after we put this whole thing together that there is a major event happening this coming Sunday, which is the anniversary of William Blake's death in London at his right stop. Um, there has been a head stuck there for some time, but it's a noise that's not the actual exact place where he was buried. They've now kind of worked out to their own satisfaction. So money's been raised in the sculptures. Right, a wonderful head start. And there's going to be a huge event there at three o'clock this Sunday uh, with all kinds of people, all sorts of bike deliveries, such as bike off the radio, bike off the ocean, and various people, well known for the night, there's a bit of a ceremony, it's 191 years since he died, 191 candles, uh, you know, people have been like iced up on his grave. It seems obvious that it's not separate from what we're doing here. That in terms of bigger picture, that is the dynamism is that it's driving us on why it's going on. It's all one and the same. So a few of us are going to go down there for that, and I'll put it out to everybody. Uh, it needs to be known that this is going on, and that there's no civilization there, this is all part of one enormous way to do that. So, thank you.